Hey folks, Bill Wilson here with my buddy Ken Hackathorn. Welcome to another episode of Gun Guys. Uh, Ken, you live in the Salmon, Idaho area now, and that's old Elmer Keith's country, isn't it? Sure uh, is. Real famous gun rider from the old days and uh, kind of the guy that uh, pushed all the right buttons to get the, the 44 Magnum created. Yeah. So I'd like to talk to you about 44 Magnums today. And, uh, you know, we got a, an Elmer Keith commemorative 44 right here. A real nice one. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting, Bill. I vote, I grew up in the time frame you did where the 44 Magnum was kind of a cool guy gun to have. We all thought it was literally the most powerful handgun on, on earth. And at the time it probably was. Um, I bought a four inch, actually pre-29 when I was probably 20 years old. I remember paid 120 bucks for it at a high gun collector show. And I tried to wear it out. Only thing I wore out was my hands, <laughs> you know. But the uh, interesting thing is that probably, we all know the history, Elmer Keith was, prior to World War II, started a group of people, that, what they called the 44 Associates, a group of guys who tuned and loaded 44 Special, often to some pretty astronomical mm -hmm. levels. And uh, that was, a, it's an accurate cartridge. It's a very popular cartridge. Fortunately, back then they had like your Colt Shooting and Master and the Smith & Wesson Triple Lock and the second model and third model Smith & Wesson 44 Special with really good shooting handguns. Mm -hmm. So they, there was a select group of guys and Elmer was always a believer that as we know, like big bullets and all the power he could get. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he started loading a 44 Special up to a level that was probably by Sammy standards, not acceptable. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of fast forward in the 50s when he was working for the American Rifleman and going to, this is pre-shot show days, the NRA show was the gathering of the gun culture mm -hmm. back then. And he started talking to Remington about loading a cartridge that he was basically wildcatting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they said they would if they could, there was a gun for it. And he went to Carl Hellstrom at Smith & Wesson and said, made the pitch and said, we'll build the gun if somebody will make the ammo. So eventually it all came together. And really Remington produced a round. They made it a tenth of an inch long in a 44 Special because they didn't want the 44 Magnum be fitted into those old mm -hmm. triple locks, which would pretty much blow them up. So they created a cartridge with more power, velocity and pressure than he actually asked for. And the gun was introduced, it was pretty much introduced in 55, not really put on the market until 56. And they were slow sellers. Um, this, as the story goes, many of us from, can remember finding 44 Magnums back say in the, in the 60s for sale where uh, there was a box of either Winchester or Remington 44 Mag with six empty cases in it yeah. and the gun was for sale. Um, and the few people that understood the virtue if you lived in a part of the world where you needed a powerful handgun or you hunting handgun hunting was kind of its infancy yeah then, back but, then it was but there are a few people that mm -hmm. chose to hunt with handguns and uh the 44 magnum then was the go-to gun as you can remember when bob peterson who was the guy that started guns and ammo magazine mm -hmm. i can remember as a kid reading an article where he went to alaska and killed a polar bear with a, he had a six and a half inch nickel yeah, model 29. 29. And uh, it was, wow, that was a big deal. Yeah. And really, as you know, it was the introduction of the first of the Dirty Harry movies. Yeah. That's when, and that's when the popularity it, of the, they, the, the 29 and the yeah. 44 Magnum really took off. Suddenly, Smith and West couldn't make enough of mm -hmm. it. Now, interestingly enough, about two and a half weeks ago, I was in California doing a class with Larry Vickers. And we got to spend an evening at the ISI studios, the people that are the gun rental for the movie mm -hmm. industry. And among the guns we got to talk about on this Facebook Live thing, and we got a finger, you know, was one of the original Dirty Harry Model 29. Oh, wow. yeah. that, that's cool. Yeah. So cool guns. And like I say, after the Dirty Harry movie started, wow, I mean, you couldn't find one. And they, they sold for often double the retail mm -hmm. price. Oh, yeah. You know? And from then on, I think the demand was pretty well established. In hindsight, if you look at the calibers that have since come down the road, uh, really the 44 Magnum is kind of a lightweight compared to what we can buy oh, today. Oh yeah, compared to the 454 Casul and the 480 rear and the line ball cartridges and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, and uh, heaven forbid the 500 Smith and Wesson. Oh, which, yeah. And a 460. Yeah. <laughs> Out of curiosity, Bill, you've done a lot of handgun hunting over the years. Did you ever hunt 
spent much with a 44 mag? Oh yeah, I did a lot of, the, early on, I did almost all my hunting with a 44 mag. I mean, I took, took Cape Buffalo with it, took, took a big male line with it, a lot of, a lot of African Plains game, you yeah. know, with a 44 mag. Of course yeah. that was using, you know, 300, 320 grain solids, you know, so I got good penetration, that sort of thing. You know, I've got a number of, most of mine are all, I've got a couple of Rugers, but most of mine are mostly Smith, either 29s or 629s, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I still in the summertime, I live in a real rattlesnake zone. And often in the summertime, I carry one of my four inch uh, 29s with the first two cylinders low with that CCI snake shot, mm -hmm. which is, you know, really blows those rattlesnakes yeah, apart. Right. And uh, I, I'm, like I said, I've always liked them. I've got a five inch and I've got a four or five, I think six, six and a half, eight and three eighths. I've got a number of different ones, but I love the fives, mm -hmm. but uh, I still, they're still fun to shoot. Although I shoot a lot more 44 specials than I do 44 magnums these days. Oh yeah, it's 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 uh, kind of one of those deals. How many times do you shoot 357 magnum or 357? It's usually yeah. 38 specials. So yeah, that's the truth. And this obviously, I think um, this was, was it in the 80s sometime when the, they decided to make a commemorative run of these guns for Elmer Key. I'm not sure what the dates were, but it, you know it was after he was awarded the Outstanding Man American yeah. Handgunner Award and all that kind of stuff. And there, you know. There's one good Elmer Key story I'd like to tell you. Where I live, every time I run into somebody that's an older resident of that area, I always ask, did you know Elmer Keith? And their reviews are mixed. But I remember talking to one guy and about, he said, you know, out up on when you, Elmer was an outfitter. He took hunters out quite often. Mm -hmm. And he took some guys up to what's now part of the, or in the edge of the Frank Church Wilderness, which was a good hunting area. And as, as the hunter, they'd finish hunting, I think mule deer, and they were coming back down the Salmon River towards the city of Salmon. They're still about 40 miles out. And um, there's a little area called Shoop, and there was a general store, which at that time had a saloon, a little bar. So they decided to pull in and have a little you know, sip. Elmer was fairly fond of the scotch, and they set, sat up a barrel walk. Elmer always wore his 429 ivory stock, you know, wore it all the time. And he sits up at the bar there and he's having a drink. And some of the locals kind of make fun of him when you got a big gun, bet you can't hit anything with it. And apparently Elmer's basically said, no, I think I can. And there's some money bet was made. And that was back in the days when $20 was, was know, back when gas was 35 cents a gallon, 20 yeah. bucks was a lot. So the guy put $20 in the bar and Elmer told the the gal that was the the waitress or the bartender watch the money. So they walk out on the porch of the of the general store, and right across the road is was well, still then was power lines with a little the glass insulators on the poles. And so Elmer pulls out the twenty nine in one hand, cocks it, bam, blows one of the insulators off, cocks it again, bam, blows another one off, cocks it again, third try, bam, and when he did that insulator, the lights went off. <laughs> And he just put the gun in the holster, went back in, sat down, reached over and got the $20 bill and put it in his pocket, ordered another round, said the gal lit the lantern, you know, <laughs> and the, the, the naysayers were pretty pretty quiet. But as the guy, old guy was telling me, he said, you can say a lot of things about Armour Keith, but you trust me, he could shoot. Yeah. So pretty cool. Yeah. Good story. Hey. Hey, enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was a good time, Bill. Yeah. Folks, be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel. There'll be more gun guys coming up in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you.